Thank you for being here. For everybody who's watching the stream, thank you for not being here. <laughs> what we're going to talk about actually is how you prep for things that you're going to do as an editor. What I did want to do is I just wanted to go down the line here so you get a sense of the variety of the people we have. Zach has uh, done uh, trailers and lots of TV features as well, uh, as well as directed and produced a documentary called Go Far. He's the founder of Fitness and Post. Dan, he's done a bunch of uh, Marvel films, but also some smaller movies like Elf, right? <laughs> Which nobody's ever heard of. And Yvette Mirian, uh, you've done not just editing in reality, but you've also been writing and uh, producing and a wide, wide range of things. Uh, that were. All three of these people, by the way, have taught at USC. What I would like to do is to talk about preparation that you might do before you even have the job. So what kind of prep do you all do in order to get the job when you're going for an interview? Most of the time, if I know who I'm going to be meeting with and if I know what the show is, I'll do a lot of research on, you know, it has a show been multiple seasons, I'll watch as many episodes as I can, I'll do research on the executive producers, showrunners, directors, whoever it is that I'm going to be meeting with just to get a sense of what the show is, what their style is. Um, if I've crossed paths with them before, if I know anybody that they know, that's always a really great um, starting point, I think. Uh, especially because that gives them an idea of, you know, who have you worked with before and what types of series and shows have you done. Are you looking at old episodes? That Absolutely, yeah. So Whale Wars, for example, I got that job because I knew the executive producer, but before I started the position, so I didn't really have to interview for that, but before I started the position, I did a lot of research and wa I watched every single episode before I went in because I'd never done a series like that before. Great. What about you, Dan? I like to go to the interview and I like to talk about the story issues and mainly that rather than things like logistics and what you've done. I sort of approach interviews as if I'm interviewing them as well. I actually look for anything that, that may be the challenge or a flaw, and I like to bring it right up because I want to see if uh, they're really going to be collaborative. Because part of my experience now is to, to do what I can to avoid the no-win situation. So I'll also, of course, look at uh, the resume of all those people involved, mm -hmm. try to even examine the outside politics mm -hmm. if it's worth uh, walking into this uh, hornet's nest. Then I'll go to my Santeria altar and cut a chicken's head off, <laughs> and then uh, I get the job. That's good prep. Um, so has that changed over the years for you in terms of what you feel you need to do when you go in, or is that pretty much the same now as when you did that president. You get to the point where you can maybe make some choices. I'm trying not to water down uh, my resume. I'm trying to keep it, keep it really solid. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about that. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, uh, you know, they could boot you out any day. Yeah. You know, they could figure out that I'm a fraud <laughs> and have been all these years. So I do think more about what are the the chances of success. And then I look at everything and, you know, everything from is this something that I haven't done, which is very appealing to me, to, um, well, is the money good? Mm -hmm. And uh, if the money isn't good, why should I do it? Zach, why don't, you, you've kind of talked about how you follow certain um, producers from one job to another. They get to know you, they like you, and they ask you to come along. What sort of advanced work do you feel you need to do in situations to know this will be a good situation for me to walk into? It's really important for me to understand, like Dan said very clearly, what kind of environment I'm gonna be getting into, because in this business environment is so key. But like, for example, when I got into television, I didn't have any experience in it and I had to prove that I was capable of doing the job. And for example, before I interviewed for my first TV job on Burn Notice for doing one pickup episode for somebody that was absent, I spent two weeks watching the first three seasons of the show twice. And that was, I think, 48 or 50 episodes at the time. That's mm -hmm. all I did was watch it over and over and over until it was so subconsciously ingrained in my brain mm -hmm. that I understood the style, I understood the characters, I understood the pacing. It's kind of like listening to a piece of music over and over and over, and then it, you all of a sudden kind of feel the rhythm of it. 
That's a process that I always used to go through when I would interview for feature films or any other type of job, is I would get to know who the director is, because when I was younger, nobody knew who I was. I was trying to go in and impress them. So I would get to know the director really, really well, almost like to a level of creepy. <laughs> and I would get to know what films they like, and then I would watch those films, and I would bring up those films in meetings. So they would say, oh, well, you know, what do you think of this, that, or the other thing? I'm like, well, there's this great scene in this one movie, and they're like, I love that movie. I'm like, really? You do? <laughs> so what I do is I really... Like now it's sounding crazy. Yeah, it is. Oh, it's, 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 but I mean, that, that's what it took for me to break in because nobody knew who I was and I was trying to prove that I could do it and I had the ambition and the intensity to get to know them well enough. But because of that, they really respected the fact that I had a feel for their material. Usually it got me the job, sometimes it didn't get me the job. Mm -hmm. But I really got to know the director, and in TV it really is more about knowing producers and not directors, because yeah. directors are more for hire per episode. Mm -hmm. So I get to know the producers or the writers that are gonna be doing the hiring, mm -hmm. and that way I understand what they want, what their taste is. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's really it's so much more about personality and knowing if it's the kind of person that you want to be in the room with, but more importantly, do they want you in their room for 12 hours a day taking hold of their show? Because especially in TV, it's so hands-off. Your showrunner does not have time right. to sit in a room for six weeks on an episode the way that you would on a feature. So they really have to trust that you are going to make the right choices mm -hmm. for them. So it's just giving them the confidence to know that you're so that person. You talk about choices, right, and selecting things to go up for. What about you, Yvette? Are you recommending the same thing to people who are just starting out mm -hmm. as we've just talked about what you do? I remember really early on, I, I started in documentaries and reality and primarily in television and eventually I got to the point where now I'm cutting scripted, but I was so anxious to make that move that any time I would get a script, I would get really excited about it. And one of the editors who I was an assistant for, she, she gave me some really great advice. She said, are you gonna be proud of, of that script? Are you going to be proud of putting that on your resume? And I thought about it and I said, no. And so I turned it down and I, I don't regret it because I, I don't see that it would have taken me anywhere in the scripted world. So mm -hmm. I'm happy that I held off on that. I, I think you have to trust yourself sometimes if you think that it's going to be a negative experience or that it's not going to add anything valuable. I think it's okay to say no in those circumstances. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I think when you're first, first starting out, you want to be able to get as much to, you want to be able to say, I've cut something. Mm -hmm. you know, definitely, that's, that's very important. So what about you, Dan? Well, I would say that that is accurate when you start. You, you know, these are the first cards you're dealt. Yeah. Anyone who is willing to pay you or even not pay you to edit, you need to go and build up to the point. And then when it gets to the point where you can make your first hardcore decision, which is always a crossroads. Do I do this okay. or don't I do this? Or is, is this available to me here? The scariest mm -hmm. thing and the most powerful thing is to say no. Because if you say no, sometimes it actually really good things come from mm -hmm. it. They want, they want you more, they know, you're, they know you're serious, or they just don't care and they move on. So, uh, in which case, it's really good you didn't jump in. Well, and exactly, and it's, it's, it's scary, but the no's were always as important as what I said yes to. Yeah. But I have to, uh, I have to challenge Zach on something here. Uh oh. Uh, I went up for a job and uh, um, and I was having an amazing rapport with the director. We were talking about how his film should should uh, play, and I said, you know, I see this, I see this playing like Midnight Run, and he said, oh my God, yeah, that is so perfect. And thank you so much. And so the next day, I heard they hired Mike Tronic, who had <laughs> Midnight Run. <laughs> One thing that I think I'm hearing threaded throughout um, all of your answers is to come prepared. What that preparation is might be different for each one of you. But you've all sort of talked about reading of script or looking at old material, uh, uh, old uh, shows. So I think that's pretty important. Now let's, let's say that you get the job. Before shooting begins, what sort of prep do you do? Do you go to all the production meetings? Are you in tone meetings? Uh, uh, I, like to, I like to have a conversation with the director. About what? Um, usually about tone. Tone is the is the chief. How is this thing supposed to feel? How is it supposed to play? And then nowadays I, I like to talk about some of the uh, difficulties I can foresee. And sometimes 
these are you know, very talented directors, but it's sometimes good to remind them of what the prize is. So Zach, do you have a discussion with the showrunner, with the producers about tone? Yeah, what I do, even before the first day where you're actually in front of your workstation and you're worried about drives and bins and all that stuff, to me there's a much more important conversation that needs to be had. So once I have the job, then it goes from me being interviewed to me interviewing, and I'm relentless about this process. I, was, I, just, uh, I did a pilot before coming back to my second season of Empire, and it was a director that I had worked with on Empire, and he was an executive producer and director on this pilot. It still hasn't come out. It comes out next year. And I started emailing him, and I said, what are the five to ten movies that you have watched to help build your tone booklet and figure out your cinematography and what have you shown to your cinematographer what have you shown to your costume designer like mm -hmm. and then they don't email you back because they're in pre-production and then I email them again and I say so those ten movies what are they right and then eventually they get to it and then I'll speak to him or I'll speak to the showrunner or the writers and I'll say what score or music do you listen to when you write. What, what were you hearing in your head or what were you listening to as you were writing? Because a lot of writers will have the same music on a loop because it gets their mind in a certain space to write their tone and write their dialogue and it's the closest they can get to actually sitting in front of a screen in their world. So I will start listening to the music that they're listening to, even if it's something that will never be in the show. Mm -hmm. I'm now in their headspace. So it's kind of, it's a process that I've coined method editing where <laughs> method actors will just become the person that they are, even between takes, after takes, and their trailer afterwards. And I've developed this process where I've completely just become immersed in whatever the type of show it is that I'm working on. And then by the time I start, and they start seeing the work, they're like, yeah, this is exactly what we were looking for, because I didn't just say, well, I'm gonna make it what I wanna make it. Right. Of course I'm gonna infuse my own opinions and feelings, but I wanna make sure it's within the world that they've created for the months before they even hired me. First of all, I like, that you talked about having your own opinions, having your own point of view, not being afraid to push them and to talk about them. So I saw you nodding your head during a lot of what Zach was saying. I, I actually do that a lot too with the music. Uh, you know, um, this this last series that I did, I had a very similar meeting with the with the showrunner about what kind of music are you visualizing, and we we talked a lot about different movies that he wanted me to watch as reference. I was producing that series, but when I was when I when I cut especially once I actually start the process of cutting, if there's music that involves lyrics, if there's music that is from a specific score that we're using as temp, I'll listen to it over and over again, and I just kind of keep visualizing the scene and mm -hmm. how it's going to play out. So I find that interesting, because I, I do that a lot too. I've held a lot of positions on series, and I think we have this a little bit more in reality, like supervising editor or lead editor. Being involved in how are we gonna organize the show? What cameras are we shooting on? The technical specifications, what is that going to mean uh, with workflow and, and things like that? How are the assistants gonna organize the project? How are all the different editors going to access everything? Mm -hmm. So I definitely find myself doing a lot of that as well once I've been hired on the job before I start. There, there's something that I talk about with my students, and actually I did this for a film I'm about to start work on in a couple of weeks, which I call crawling up inside the director's head, <laughs> that there's something that you want to at least be comfortable enough inside their, their brain mm -hmm. to sort of understand what their thought process is, what they would like to get out of any beat or any emotion or anything that's going on in the story. The more I know that, the easier it will be to kind of merge my choices in with the overall. One thing I like to do is to, and this director is perfectly happy with it, most of the directors I've worked with have been, is to go to rehearsals. I love doing that. Just watching the interaction, the adjustments that are made helps me learn a lot. My personal feeling, and I know that editors have very different feelings about this idea of going to set or being in rehearsals, I avoid it like the plague. Number one, because I just don't like being on set, which is why I chose to edit in a small dark room for a living. But the other reason is that I find that if I see the entire world through this, it's easier to make choices than if I've seen something on set and I know where the light is or I know that they were cheating this wall for that wall and I start to see that stuff. And if I just see this, then I know exactly what the audience is looking at, and if I'm noticing something, they're gonna notice something, so I lose my sense of objectivity. Mm -hmm. But I know a lot of editors that actually learn things and are able to improve their work because they're on set, so I'm not saying one is right or wrong. Just for me, at most, for any project, if I have access to the set, it's about two hours maximum mm -hmm. for the duration of the shoot, mm -hmm. and then I've met my quota and I'm good. So, so um, let me sort of 
make a differentiation then between shooting and prep also. I find that, uh, and I certainly haven't worked on stuff at the level that the three of you do, but um, I've certainly discovered that if I am a known face mm -hmm. in prep, right, I'm there usually for the big production meeting beforehand, but um, uh, then when something does come up during shooting, I'm not the faceless asshole in the editing room calling about it. Mm -hmm. I'm someone who has uh, worked with the script supervisor ahead of time. So you're the asshole with a face, then? Yes, that's right. <laughs> Which actually I much prefer. Right? Right. So um, script supervisor is very important to, to what we do. Yes, no? Well, I, I've always been a visual person, so uh, script supervisors, the thing I want to know from them is very simple. If you change what you're doing, is this an alt or is, this, is there a reason? I want to know that. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I do especially want to bring up, um, when, when we dive onto projects, they're pretty all-consuming and they involve a lot of hours and a lot of time. So what sort of things do you do before you dive in, uh, I don't know, go to the dentist or uh, <laughs> you know, kind of take care of those things? What are the things that you do to prepare yourself for that sort of experience where you get swallowed whole. I do, I do a lot of that. I do all the doctor's appointments and, and things like that. I spend as much time with my family as I can. <laughs> right. um, I, I really do because it, it is very all-consuming and it, it does take up so much of your time that it just sort of becomes your life for a while. Mm -hmm. So I definitely find myself doing that. Yeah. This is an easy lob to you also. Is right. Uh, so what are the things that you do to get yourself prepped? Well, the, the big thing that I actually do is I try to develop some form of system to my schedule mm -hmm. so it doesn't become all-consuming. Because mm -hmm. I've lived that life for so long where you say, I can only do dentist appointments and chiropractor appointments and this, that, or the other thing while I'm on hiatus. And I've decided just say, I'm done with that. I don't want to live that way anymore, and I want to restructure my life so I still have a life while I'm working, and I still work 60 plus hours every week on a normal week when I'm not busy. But what I do is I really sit down and say, all right, what does my ideal day or my ideal week look like? And I'm very, very anal about how I lay it out and say, on the perfect week, what have I done during the day? What are my blocks of time? What do I want to accomplish? And are there enough hours in the day to do them? And then I develop systems to make sure that I can actually fit all of those things in and I'm prioritizing. And I'm saying one of the, the most important thing to me is I want to find a way to get home and put my kids to bed or read them a story four nights a week, mm -hmm. right? That's not an easy thing to do when you work 90 minutes away from your house and you're working 60 hours a week, but I find ways to create more efficiencies in certain places and just build a system so I know that here's what the ideal week looks like, here's what it takes to accomplish it. I never actually get there, but a lot of times I get close. It takes a lot of discipline yeah. to get to the point where you can do that, but I found that the amount of time it's opened up in my day and my life and just being able to not get consumed and still have a life outside of work, it's made a huge difference for mm -hmm. me. I think also, like, when you have a kid, I don't know about you, and I, I don't know what your situation is, but making sure, you know, my partner, my mom, my mother-in-law, my babysitter, whoever it is that's going to be watching my kid, making sure I have some sort of schedule in place just helps me feel better to know, okay, someone's picking him up, someone's dropping him off if I can't do it. So mm -hmm. I think that's really important, too, is just communicating with whoever your help is mm -hmm. to make sure everyone's on the same page. Mm -hmm. So what about you, Dan? I have no kids, so I've got all the time in the world. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you, we were talking before this began that like you're looking at potentially three straight years right now hmm. where that you'll be involved in high-intensity projects. Well, these things are marathons uh, when you're on feature films. They ramp up. Uh, you know, it gets, it gets crazier as it goes. Some, sometimes there's the rare one that starts off right away crazy, but usually... There's a, there's a kind of a... Where does it go from there, then? <laughs> well, the, the, yeah, exactly. Normally, if I'm starting a gig, it's going to ramp up slow. And, you know, I'm not going to, you know, run in real fast and eager. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let this thing start to percolate. I don't like to be more than a couple days behind the camera, but uh, I'm going to not start getting into the more advanced stuff. Part of that's also... A, um, having done the process so many times, realizing the dangers of tightening the, the lug nuts too early. Mm -hmm. Just pace this thing right, and then I can 
go ahead and, and do the things that I uh, normally do in life up until we hit a certain uh, point where then stuff starts to, to fall away. And it really it just does depend on the project. So what I've heard from all three of you is there's a certain aspect of prepping yourself, of kind of getting to a place emotionally where you're ready to give a large amount of your brain to the artistry that you bring, uh, as well as to simply the amount of work you're gonna be doing. Maybe we should leap back to what you were talking mm -hmm. about before in terms of establishing workflow. Each of you work on very different sorts right. of things, so I want each of you to kind of talk about this. I think it depends on the show. Uh, you know, uh, how many cameras are you shooting on? What kind of music are we using? Uh, what kind of cameras are we shooting on? Um, what is the style of the show? How do I want everything organized? How many editors are going to be working on it? And depending on all how that... How many do you typically work with on a, on a show depends. like Whale Wars? Oh, Whale like? Wars? Gosh. Uh, 12, I think 12 to 15. Depending. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're all working on different episodes at a time. So I was a lead editor and I had two editors working with me and then there were three other teams mm -hmm. of the same type. And we would all rotate episodes. But, I mean, if you're working on a bigger, you know, live reality series, you're talking about a lot more editors than mm -hmm. that. If you're working on um, something of a smaller scale, um, it could be as, you know, this last show that I did was a cable series. That was only like four editors. So mm -hmm. it, it really depends. It depends on the show. So are you bringing an assistant along who knows how you like things set up um, typically? It depends. Or? Again, sometimes the company already has assistants in place when I come in. Sometimes I recommend someone and they end up hiring mm -hmm. them. But it's a little bit of a different process with us because they have post-supervisors in place and they like to interview everyone. And, you know, they they have certain workflows that they, that they like to meet. So... I don't, I usually recommend somebody and hope that they'll be okay with hiring them. Okay, what about you, Dan? How, are you working with the same assistant, if possible? How yeah, I mean, I've had a, a, my first assistant, um, you know, like 18 years or something like that. And in my world, she runs the editing room, and I just lock my doors and edit. Mm -hmm. um, so... When when we start, yeah, there, there's a bunch of people scrambling around. How are we going to do it? How are we going to set it up? We'll we'll find out if there's uh, whatever the specs are. You know, uh, I don't really even care that much of what they're shooting on and how. Mm -hmm. You know, um, what Zach said earlier about you know looking in the uh, in the monitor and seeing what's in front of me is absolutely mm -hmm. my perspective as well. Is that um, you know, well, it's all great. You used a what? Oh, okay, I don't really care. Uh, <laughs> but I'll bet right you here. do care about things like, um, uh, does my uh, chair face the door or away from oh, yeah. the door? Uh, that refrigerator's too small. Yeah. <laughs> uh, First world problems. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, the, the get the creature comforts. Every, everyone will have those needs. So yeah, we'll, we'll get set up on a, on a job and um, you know, see what, what, if there's bells and whistles on the editing systems that we need. The funny thing is that I've been cutting movies on, uh, on Avid's since 1993. So yeah, the, it's, it's the same thing, you know. Yeah. It's the they're they're better versions of the same thing that we've been using all those years. So. Mm -hmm. It's it's all pretty uh, normal. Every once in a while, I'll see somebody with a fancy gizmo and I'll go, "I need that," and then I'll get it and I'll never <laughs> use it. But but you have a certain way, I would guess, that your assistant knows on how you like your folders and bins organized. Yes, right? yes. So that's part of a communication thing that happens? Does it change over the years? Or? Well, it, it has because the everything in, in terms of the way things are shot and gathered has changed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we used to digitize. Mm -hmm. I don't think, does anybody do that anymore? Uh, now we just get data in and uh, it comes in. There's words like LUTs and things like that. Mm -hmm. That again, uh, um, I, like I should care. I, like I Yeah, <laughs> I should care about, but I don't. As long as somebody's got it dealt with, mm -hmm. and I can do the Zach process of staring in a box, <laughs> then I'm fine. So, what about you, Zach? I I know you spent 
an entire podcast. Yeah, I was, was going to say I could go on for this about an hour and seventeen <laughs> minutes, but I don't need to because I just did. So yeah, actually, the the last episode I just released, which is fitnessandpost.com/slash/fifty-four, shameless plug. Um, I actually talked through this whole process, but to kind of distill it down very quickly, um, I trained in martial arts for years. And what they always teach you is that you have to learn how to do things and just react like this and not, you, there's no space to think. If you're in a confrontation, there's no space to think, well, should I be blocking this way or blocking this way? And when you're in the fire in at the editing room, and it, especially in television, when you have three episodes going at once, and if you have one output that goes wrong, you may not make it to air, you have to be able to just react when the bullets fly. So for me, the time between getting the job and actually getting dailies is developing systems of automation, so you never have to be in a place where you have to think about something and think, oh my God, we have to get this thing out. Well, what should we do? Do I need to do this, 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 or this, right? We've established a whole system to make sure that if we get an email that's about this subject, it goes here. If we get an email about this subject, it goes here, right? Everything is in a digital format. We don't deal with any paper. Um, and then we have, I'm a big believer in checklists, and these checklists are things that can be duplicated. So every time you do an output, every time you do anything that's a certain step of the process, there's no thought involved. Basically what I've done is I've trained myself to think as little as possible on the job. So that way when I actually do have to think and be creative, the energy is there. Mm -hmm. So the creative process in your brain takes up a tremendous amount of energy and it mm -hmm. actually burns about 20% of your calories, although the mass of your brain is only about 2% of your weight, but it burns 20% of your energy and if you're making decisions all day long that you don't need to be making, you're wasting energy. So any decisions that do not require a tremendous amount of creativity, I'm just farming them out to checklists and systems and automation, so, so all that's done. Now you brought uh, your assistant along on a number of jobs mm -hmm. after another, so I'm assuming she's fairly um, knowledgeable about what the Zach Arnold Oh yeah. Likes. Oh, um, she, you want to talk about crawling into somebody's brain? My assistant knows me better than my wife. It's scary. <laughs> um, but yes, she, yes. she and I have developed the systems together because she's very similar to me in that she's also OCD and she wants to know where everything is. And I'll say to her, I'm like, listen, I know this is really weird, but can you capitalize the, this bench? She's like, oh my God, I totally get it. Yes, I'll do that for you, right? So that is going a little bit off the deep end, and I'm not saying everybody needs to do that, but we function on the same wavelength. So we will actually challenge each other, and I'll say, all right, today we had a problem, and somebody didn't get a visual effect shot that they shouldn't have gotten from us. Why did it happen? I'm not angry with her. I just say, let's figure out why. All right, well, it's because this happened, and I didn't get this email because of this or that. And I say, all right, let's change your email filters. Let's change the system that happens when it comes in. That way the mistake is never made again. So by the time we're in the thick of it, and right now is the thick of it, I mean, we are buried right now. We're not thinking about anything, it's just your reaction, you're mm -hmm. reacting, right? So for me, the beginning of a project is building the systems so you don't ever have to think unless you actually have to think. That's cool. What about you, Yvette? So you've seen it now from the producer side, mm -hmm. from the editor side. I think from the producing side, um, it's a lot of, you know, how, they don't communicate as much with the field as I do. How are we organizing things? How are we doing the director's notes? Because it's a little bit different in that we don't have a script supervisor on set, and yet it's still it's still scripted, and we still have the takes and everything. So bringing it in, and I was the one who set up with the assistants. I want you to label it this way. This is what this color marker means, for example, and this is what this means. And um, trying to figure out what the best organization is and communicating that with the supervising editor and making sure he's on the same page. I'm definitely a lot more involved in all sides. Dan, what's your prep for, for that? Well, certainly the job of an editor is completely different at the beginning of a, mm -hmm. of a project than it is at the end. You're working on completely different issues, completely, you know, but it's the same overall. It's just that you're in, in that part of the construction. For me, I'm, I'm, I'm doing everything I can to achieve what Zach's talking about without lifting a finger. That's why I have a great assistant, and they, and they have great assistants. Mm -hmm. In order to maximize my 20% calorie loss, <laughs> I completely try to shut off from knowing how things are moved. Mm -hmm. Something my father taught me, that if you know how to do it, they'll make you do it. So he never did the laundry. Great advice. The flip of that contract is that I won't them micromanage, and if they fail, I will fall on the sword for them. Mm -hmm. 
I let uh, my first dictate the entire way, and then we had to figure out, because on these big movies, the flow between effects and yeah. set and marketing, I mean, it is severe. It's, it, just hearing about it makes me want to crawl back into my room and shut the door. And that's what I do. I crawl back into my room and I shut the door. And because I just, you know, my, my prize is solving the movie. It's, it's not making sure marketing got the six second clip. Right. That's my perspective. Now, as we, as we go, I'll start off. So I'm working in the creative realm, and then there is some organizational things that change because of that. At first, I'm just doing scenes. Each scene is its own movie at that point. As it starts getting more and more scenes, I'm finally ready to start making sequences, uh, groups of scenes together. And now everything changes. As soon as I put the one scene next to the other, I go, well... That can't start that way, so I cut the whole damn thing wrong. It's like dominoes. Mm -hmm. So then I'm recutting, and I'm re... I'm in that process already. Before the, they've ever seen my first cut, there's already four cuts that have existed uh, of just me self-reflexing on the thing. And then, because I'm in feature films, we have the luxury of completely trying things different ways, you know, the feeling is that the, the, until you've kicked the tires and seen other possibilities, you don't know, even if you got it completely right the first time, you just don't know. If, if the director or producers aren't playing devil's advocate, I'll do it myself. I know how to say, well, you probably did that completely wrong. Let's just try this a completely different way. And mm -hmm. then I'll do that and then, nope. It was right the first time. <laughs> <laughs> well, that actually leads to a, um a question we got on Twitter here about kind of reframing things in your mind while the editing process is going on. So um, the question is, what steps do you take to recut a scene based on notes mm. that require you to change your perspective on the scene? Mm, this is probably, I, I would have to think about it a little bit, but yeah. I have had several instances where this has happened on a much larger level than a scene. I've had entire episodes yep. where I've been told, so this airs in two weeks and this doesn't work at all. Yep. We'd like you to start over. Yep. Terrific. I actually went through this last year. And you, you have to release yourself from the choices that you made the first time. Yeah. And you have to stop thinking, well, this is the material that I was given and I can only do what I was given with the material. And you have to be willing to think completely outside the box and not worry about structure and not worry about the structure of scenes, the structures within a specific scene, and just start messing around with stuff. And one of the luxuries that you have in TV is that you have a lot of other episodes. And you wouldn't think to yourself, well, I can't use that stuff, but a lot of times you actually can because you have the same actors that are a lot of times in similar locations, a lot of times with similar wardrobe, and I've actually used pieces of other scenes from other episodes in new episodes to solve problems where something was missing, where a director missed a moment, mm -hmm. where a story point doesn't work, might be doing a split screen or a three screen, whatever it is, and all of a sudden you just, you're basically rewriting the show. Like I had to rewrite an entire episode, taking scenes out and then starting the scene in a different place and taking voiceover or dialogue from different episodes to motivate a scene. And you just have to be willing to accept that the work you've done so far was a great learning experience mm -hmm. and it was a complete and total waste of time. <laughs> and that it just doesn't exist anymore because mm -hmm. the, the hardest thing that I went through as a younger editor was that feeling of, <coughs> well, no. My first cut is the best one. I know the material yeah. better than anybody else. You don't know the dailies like I know the dailies. But then you realize that maybe it does actually suck and it doesn't yeah, sometimes work. Sometimes we could be wrong. Well, so I saw you in hearty agreement I, I, with the yeah. entire show rewrite concept. I think, I, especially I think it's important to note as a younger editor, I, I was always very emotionally attached to the shows that I would do. And same thing, like, no, what do you mean it's the best version? And it, there have been times even for logistical reasons. Let's say we didn't meet our TRT or, you know, so-and-so wants this part of this in another episode that you have to blow the whole thing up where you're... TRT is total running time, Total running time, time by sorry. The way. And, and, you know, when you're a day away from locking the show. So I've even had things like that happen, and it's, it's devastating, but you just, you know, I, I, I take like an hour to let it digest, and then you just have to move forward. You know, you, there's no time to waste. And absolutely, I mean, rewriting, rewriting a show is, in my experience, it's always done in edit, and especially in reality and documentary. I mean, you have so much to, you know, right. you know play around with, and, and, um, and, and even, in, in, and like you said, in scripting, I mean, we had, we had done a, 
a show recently where it was like the whole ending wasn't working and everyone just kept trying to figure out a way, how are we going to sell it? So let's just take out the ending. So we took out the ending and we worked with the other scenes that we had and we were able to do it. And it worked great and it ended up being one of everyone's favorite little episodes. So you have to take yourself out of it emotionally. You have to take yourself out of it as this is something that I did and I crafted with my own hands. And you have to just say, I, I, it's bigger than me. It's, I want to be happy as well, but the people who I'm working with and collaborating with have to be pleased with it as well. Mm -hmm. So. so you've all edited and worked on documentaries too, right? Does the doc, because there's so much extensive rewriting and re-re-rewriting and all of that, did that prepare you at all um, for the amount of rewriting that you have to do in, in fiction? I think documentary editing and nonfiction editing in general has made me a better prepared editor for scripted because I, I have a really strong understanding of what is what you can do, the things that you're capable of doing in that rewriting process. And I think if I hadn't done that, I may have been a little more, I may not have been as open-minded as I am about, well, why don't we just blow this whole thing up and do this and do that? I, I, made a, I may have been more emotionally attached when it came to I like to that it. expression, yeah. let's blow it all up. Yeah. What about you, Dan? How do, yeah, I think how it, do you get there? I think editing documentaries is, is makes you very sharp. And uh, it, it really, because you just don't have it, so everything you fashion is from what's there. And, and as you try to move mountains, you know, you, you have to find all these tricks. And those then translate straight into, into the other work you do. Um, it just really builds, it builds your editing muscle, you know, doing that stuff. Mm -hmm. Regarding the notes thing, uh, it's probably the, the, the key issue of all of editing. And the, the thing, there's a few things to keep in mind and that is that the piece is living and breathing. So when you finish a cut, it you know it's still alive. If if as as you as you make things, things tend to condense. As things condense, they no longer the the way other things were done no longer feel right against those things. So you can have an editor's assembly that actually is a, a wonderful editor's assembly, but it's not, it's not yet a, a film because it's, it's too out there, it's too meandering, it's too slow. So there's a few tricks of the trade. One, uh, first I'll state, unless you actually do get emotionally in it, you can't do great work. So that's, nice. that's the screwed up part. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because now you're setting yourself up for uh, you know, any, for whatever rejection they're going to give you in front. But then, lo and behold, you, you start to realize that regardless of the notes you're given, there's still the process of going forward. Uh, as editors, we do a lot of stuff where somebody gave you a note and you're kind of addressing it, but you're kind of doing your own thing anyway, it's, it's related. The I always spirit give the, of the note is what Exactly. <laughs> well, we, we, we use phrases like that, spirit of the note, or the note behind the note. That's right. You know what the <laughs> note behind the note really is? Your uh -huh. note. It's your note. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, I'm, 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 I'm not going there because then I'll, I'll, I'll be the first because, uh, you know, uh, to be politic, I will thank them for this note that led us to here. Mm. Even if it wasn't precise because... People on the outside, even, even directors often, aren't good at pinpoint, do this and you will succeed. But if you take the note into a broader mental plane, you realize that, well, that can encompass something that's been bothering me. Mm. And I also find this, I'm always fooling myself anyway. And, yeah. and, and I know this, and I do it anyway. I can tell you not to do this, but I'll do it myself. Which is, sometimes I'll do a cut and I go, that's that right? It's, 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 yeah, it's good, it's good. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Then all of a sudden, a note lands right next to it. It's like, yeah, I knew it, that, <laughs> that damn cut. Rarely is it a complete rebuild, even when they say, ah, start again. Yeah. Well, there are pieces that you're going to use. But, you know, you, you still chose probably in the complete start over. You still chose, I would even guess, 70% of all the right things. You still chose it. It isn't throw away all the other work you did, but now rework it and make it achieve something. 
all stories, all things, they're like writing an essay. You know, you have to land what you're trying to communicate. And so that's really <clears throat> becomes the note behind the note is what are we trying to communicate? Another question that came in on Twitter, how do you best handle office politics? Dealing with directors and producers, what if they want something different in the edit? Because I know that's never happened. And is yeah, that not the fun. same question? Well, it is in a certain way, and I'm wondering if especially in television, mm. where the directors kind of step out after a, mm. a few days, right. if there's any difference there, or if it's just really the same question. Um, I think that, it's funny, I was actually thinking of answering almost that exact question in response to what he said, but it is very different in TV yeah. because it's a much faster process, but for the first, eight, 10, 12 days that you're cutting, you're getting dailies from a director and the director saying, this is my tent, I wanna do this, this, and this, and you're cutting for the director. Then you spend four days and you give them their cut and hopefully, fingers crossed, what they want is aligned with what the writers and the showrunner want. But even in TV, like he said, in features, you have the room for versions, you have the room for experimentation. TV is a sprint. You just run as fast as you can to keep up with dailies, and then you deliver a show, and then you get half a day to recuperate, and then you start getting dailies again, so you don't have that time to let things percolate and experiment. Mm -hmm. So you basically have to try and get your first version to the point where the director is gonna say, thank you so much for having my vision. So when the producers will say, well, show us your cut, you're like, do you think I had time to do an alternate version of your episode? Like, <laughs> this is the version, this is what we have, and there's a lot of things I would have done, but. I had to give you what the director wanted, so that's where a lot of the reshaping comes in. And it, it can be a great process when you're with a director that they trust that knows the show, because you can hand them a director's cut and they'll say, huh, send it to the studio, it's great, we love it. Mm. But the alternative to that is, if they don't like the director and the director made choices they don't like, you've just wasted four days, but now you've wasted an additional four days because now you have to get to where you would be by doing all the producer's notes to get to the same place. Mm -hmm. And you just kind of run in circles. So that is one thing that I miss about features is that features is a much more immersive process. You really get to know your material. And when you lock picture, you know you've kicked the tires six ways from Sunday and this is the best it's going to be. I have one thing to say on that. Uh -huh. in, in features, when the director screws up, they fire the editor. <laughs> <laughs> Don't they fire the DP first? Well, maybe, if they haven't been. Yeah, and that's very true. In, in, that in, is true. In TV, you have the protection of the showrunner working with you every yeah. episode. So if they see a horrible cut, they don't think, oh my God, we got a problem with the editor. They call the editor and say, all right, so what really what happened? happened in the room? And you tell them, they're like, all right, well, we just want to hire that guy back. But you feel a sense of protection because they have confidence in you. But yeah, in features, if the cut doesn't work and it was because of the director's choices, they're going to get rid of the editor. Right. No question. Well, that is a big difference. It's uh, in a television, there's many episodes. Yeah. In features, there's one. Mm -hmm. So it makes a big difference. So let's take a short break. So thanks a lot. Thanks. See you soon. Thank you.